Coming up in this half hour, Prince Maddock and King Arthur and Merlin. Did they once visit Kentuckiana back around the 7th century? We'll find out. Also in this half hour, we'll talk about the first Europeans to come to America. And we're not talking about Columbus 500 years ago. No, it's possible that Europeans were here in Kentuckiana uh, in about the year 574. I'd like to introduce you to two gentlemen who are holding to that theory. First of all, Jim Michael of the Ancient Kentucky Historical Society and Alan Wilson of the Arthurian Foundation. Thank you both very much for coming in. Now, who wants to tell the story about these ancient explorers? Uh, Jim, you want to start off? Well, I'll start out. Uh, basically, you've got it right. Uh, 900 years before Columbus, appears that there was a vast migration, maybe uh, 70,000. We've got 500 boats, 700 boats sailing, uh, 10 manuscripts that he'll talk about that uh, have them nailed down. They came, uh, we've got the archaeological evidence Ooh. with it. What is the archaeological evidence? Okay, that's slide number two. Oh, okay. <laughs> let's, let's go to it. Uh, first of all, we've I got... I think we've got, what do we have here, slide number one? Oh, on that's fine. Book. That's fine. That's a. Uh, that's fine. That's good. Okay. That's a, that is a uh, chunky stone, they call it. It's in the museum at, at Lexington. It was found by an archaeologist, uh, head of the archaeology department of the UK. But you notice at the bottom of it, there's kind of a broad arrow on it. Uh, next slide. I sent this over to Alan Wilson, and he sent me back. Uh, there may have been 50 of them found at Troy. What did you make of it, Alan? Well, it's, it's a relic found at Troy, where the Welsh originally claim origin. Uh, it has on it an Arwen sign. The Arwen sign is the basis of the Welsh Cauldron alphabet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the alphabet that's the root of all this. And where was the stone found? It's a hardened village, which is up by uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, that area. Mm -hmm. How old is it? Uh, sixth century, probably, but it... Uh, have they carbon dated it? Or no, they... you can't carbon date stone, no, but... No. Uh, uh, it uh, was found in 39 by William Webb, the head of the Department of Archaeology, mm -hmm. therefore it exists. Mm -hmm. There's a uh, Celtic cross, if you look closely, it's got a circle around that cross, but more importantly, it's got the three chevrons of the Kings of Glamorgan, it's part of their shield. It goes all the way back in the Bible to Genesis and uh, uh, is one of the 12 tribes. Alan, tell me about the Kings of Glamorgan. Uh, I'm not sure exactly history, the best recorded history in Europe, but something that's um, a skeleton in the closet, mm -hmm. never taught. Uh, you won't find it in any uh, school curriculum Why is in that? the UK. Why is that? Uh, possible that it uh, offends the monarchy. History has generally been structured around the monarchy and promoting the monarchy in the UK, and this is a little bit uh, of a better thorns for them. Now, this is what I find uh, fascinating. King Arthur, who I thought was mythical, mm. I didn't think he, he ever existed except in Walt Disney movies. Mm -hmm. You're saying that King Arthur's brother, Prince Maddox, mm. died here in Clark County, Indiana. And that, and that King Arthur very possibly visited Kentuckiana. Yeah, the, 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 le the legend is, is English. The fact and the history is Welsh. So you've really got the light side and the dark side of the moon. Uh -huh. There's almost an iron curtain across the board of and information doesn't seem to pass. You can find uh, school books up to 1920 in Wales where Arthur, the son of King Myrig, the grandson of King Tudrig, of Theodric, being taught as fact. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a centralization of history in the UK out of London to teach everybody the same story. Uh, stop, uh, what do we say, yeah, historical antagonisms and so on. And they've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. It's as simple as that. Now, there's a very clear record. The manuscripts we're talking about are of the greatest authenticity and antiquity. Um, many of the records written by a man named Taliesin in his poetry it says but well, i am merlin and men shall call me taliesin mm -hmm. means high intellect so it's possible uh, merlin actually exists yeah the, the record is very clear they tell of uh, a comet striking britain in the mid sixth century mm -hmm. something like the terrible tunguska explosion in siberia in 1908 which may be what prompted 70,000 people right. to take to the ocean that's and right. come here that's to right. america jim i want to ask you one last question is it possible that this was camelot America, Kentuckiana? Sure. <coughs> what a wonderful thought. Uh, we think we know where Camelot is over there. <coughs> but to answer your full question, uh, we know Arthur was killed here and was shipped out of here probably 14 miles north of the falls. Uh, the falls of the Ohio. The falls mm -hmm. of the Ohio. 
we've got a stone that was set up in his uh, uh, launching. Amazing. He was mummified, wrapped and put in his golden armor, wrapped in deerskin and taken back and hidden over there. I'm mm -hmm. sorry we've run out of time here, but you have Probably. more time tomorrow night to explain this at uh, Jefferson Community College at uh, 8 p.m. in the Hartford Building as the Jefferson Community College downtown. Also on October 27th at University of Louisville's Extram Library, that's the main library on the main campus, and then on October 30th at the Oldham County High School Auditorium. And Jim Michael and Alan Wilson, we thank you very much for stopping in this morning. That's fascinating. Pleasure. It's 16 minutes away from 7 o'clock. We'll be back with news headlines and the weather right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to Jefferson Community College. This program tonight is sponsored by the Humanities Division, and I would like to uh, recognize somebody who's been very important in helping to put this program together, Jeannie Ferguson. Jeannie, would you stand, get a nice hand, please? <clears throat> The two people you are about to see tonight and some of the evidence you are about to see tonight perhaps will be just a bit startling. I know it was to me. Remember over here, I've got Glenda over here who was doing a research paper in my class on the mound builders. And Glenda said to me, oh, by the way, this weekend over at Iva's home, they're having a gathering and they're going to be talking about King Arthur in Kentucky. And I smiled on the inside and outside and I thought probably, as Jim has said later, maybe Elvis would be there too. <laughs> At any rate, it was startling kind of news to me. I was certainly aware of the Prince-Matic tradition throughout Indiana and Kentucky because previous to that, so the only thing I ever learned is from students, previous to that I had a student who did a research paper on Prince-Matic, so I was familiar with, with that aspect. The evidence they showed made me do some flip-flops here and there, and I think you're going to uh, get a surprise or two tonight. Uh, we're going to start the program out tonight with Jim Michael, who is president of the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association. And Jim has been working on this project a few years, and then following him is going to be our guest from Cardiff, Wales, Alan Wilson. And Alan Wilson, although he doesn't look like he's old enough, has been working on this more than 35 years. So would you give a nice welcome, please, to Jim Michael and Georgia, would you catch the lights over there? Ancient Kentucky Historical Association is a chartered nonprofit organization. We've been in existence about six years. And we've been looking at O-parts, the out-of-place articles that, that's what the archaeologists call them, things that just don't fit but have never really been researched. And we don't ask you this evening to believe anything that we're about to tell you, but we do ask that you research it for yourself, look at it, look at the information that we've uncovered, and uh, maybe it'll make some sense one of these days. First of all, these are the things that we found as we looked through the last 300 years of literature. There were there was some armor plating at the falls of the Ohio that had a harp and a mermaid and some letters on it that looked Latin. There were forts and mounds, 10,000 uh, mounds in the Ohio Valley. There were forts, uh, 20, 30 of them recorded in 1820 up and down the river and, and around Kentucky that were stone, Indians said we didn't make these. Then there were at least 20 very well documented stories of Welsh speaking Indians. Encounters where they spoke for months with these people and they spoke the British tongue. They really weren't Welsh. They were really British. <laughs> I tell you, they're really trying to get into this thing. <laughs> okay. Then there were <clears throat> stories of Melungeons, a strange uh, group of people living in Hazard, Harland, Sneedville, Tennessee, that were white, that had a British tongue, and said they were Christians. Then the story of the Wallum Olam, which was a writing on sticks that was picked up by a 
Dr. Ward, who turned it over to Raffinesque, one of our first historians, and he and Eli Lilly of pharmaceutical manufacturer fame published in, in 1833 the story of the Wallum Olam. And we had mummies in five different parts of Kentucky and they were all wrapped the same way in a cloth wrapper manufactured, they thought, from the bark of trees and then put into deer skin. We've researched those and we'll show you some of that tonight. Legends, everybody knew about a Prince Maddox is on everybody's tongue. And then, of course, there was a strange writing that we found on rocks all around Kentucky. At first, we didn't know there was any in Kentucky. Now, now we do. <clears throat> this is John Filson's book, and it was published back in 1784. And in the political year, you should ask, what did he know and when did he know it? And uh, he certainly had the Maddox uh, tradition, but he had the wrong family and he had the wrong century. Okay, then there were stories uh, frequent story about the Welsh speaking Indians and he even lists one here in Kentucky but he also talks about <clears throat> the Welsh speaking Indians retaining some of the ceremonies of Christian worship interesting this is the first president of the Filson Club <clears throat> Reuben Durrett and he published in 1908, well, we really weren't interested in the 1900s because we were looking back in the 1800s, 1700s. But this guy did a fantastic job of organizing everything that we'd already been researching. Beautiful job of it. And here it was all laid out for us, all the traditions of Maddox laid out, uh, all of the Welsh-speaking Indian stories. And this is just one of three pages. He talked a little bit about Atlantis and some of the other things in the first 13 pages and the whole rest of the book is, is on the Welsh connection. <clears throat> One of the things that <clears throat> he pointed out to us that tells exactly how Maddox got lost is that there was a Richard Hacklude who published in 1582 and he took work of Guten Owen out of the Abbey. Guten Owen was a Welsh bard and the bards are the historians that did the recording. And he wrote ab about the traditions of Maddox. Okay, two years later, another fellow uh, named Dr. Powell okay, took Karadik of Landaffin's work out of an abbey, and he published it two years later. Now, he had all the traditions of Maddox, but, the, but he knew, Reuben Durrett knew, <coughs> that Karadik died in 1150. 57. So the scenario of Maddox sailing in 1170 just isn't on. All right. Then when I talked to Alan Wilson in Wales, I said, hey, we ought to look for this guy. He said, okay, we'll, we'll help you find him. He started looking and he found Walter Mapp writing in uh, uh, 1130 about Maddox and someone in 1100. And he said, hey, these guys got the wrong Maddox. And sure enough, they did. Now, had had, had Reuben Durrett gone across the river or looked in the four ancient books of Wales, he would have known about this. This is what Durrett said. He said Taliesin was a Welsh bard in the 6th century, and he said the Welsh bards had the traditions of Maddox, and they did. If he'd gone to the book of Taliesin, it says right there, Maddox was the son of Uther. Well, that's a clue. Uther means amazing, wonderful. It's a title, Uther Pendragon, amazing commander-in-chief. So there's six of them. So the question is, which one was it? Now, in his footnotes, he was this close. He said that the, Arch, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury in the history of the world said that King Arthur had knowledge of America and that a prince of Wales found it first. He didn't know Maddox was the prince. but he was right on, he had it, and this is in his footnotes. Here's an interesting thing, we call this soft archaeological evidence because we can't really uh, tag it definitely, <clears throat> but this jug was found in the possession of, was found down along Cumberland River, but it's a three-headed uh, jug, base, and it was in the possession in 1820 of a gentleman in Lexington, Kentucky, 
nobody knew exactly what it was, but a neat kind of a thing and certainly uh, not American Indian. Up in Ohio, another three-headed stone was found. It has a head going this way, a head going this way, and a face of an animal going the other way. Three different heads, some interesting looking things on the forehead, and it translates out <coughs> in the Colburn alphabet. The Colburn alphabet we'll be talking about a little later is in fact the alphabet that was used by the Welsh-speaking Indians. There's the translation. Back 200 and 300 uh, BC, there were three faces all over Europe. It was a pagan tradition, they called it. It actually came out of the Babylonian area where Alan Wilson is going to tell you that these people came from. They were Chaldean. But there's the three-headed jug and there's a the three-headed stone. In the church where Arthur, uh, excuse me, Arthur's father is buried, King Myri, we took this picture of them sharing the eyes of three heads. This, is, uh, this was ordered a decree from Rome to destroy all of these three heads all through Britain because they were thought to be pagan. And uh, they slipped up and left this one there, kind of neat. The important thing, however, is that one of those heads has on the very top of it, if you look up high, it has a broad arrow or an Awin sign. It's the sign of God, E A Yah, becomes Jehovah. Anyway, unwritten, silent word for God. Definitely belonged to these people. In Britain, a couple blocks from Alan's house, on one of the bridges, we find this Awin sign. We find it in the churches. We find it on the prison jackets. We find it. Uh, uh, all over everything that is owned by the government, bayonets, you name it. And uh, it's interesting because here it is on what the archaeologists in Kentucky call a chunky stone, a gaming stone. <clears throat> so I sent this over to Alan, his partner, Brahm, and I said, uh, what do you make of this? And he sends me back six more just like it from Troy, where you're going to find these people came from. It isn't a chunky stone or a gaming stone. This is a whirl. They use these to manufacture cloth. Okay? It's like a flywheel. But you notice that it has the Awin signs all over it. Well, then as soon as I started looking at that, we started looking at Heinrich Schliemann's work, who dug up Troy. Uh, and the dates on these go back 500 B.C. So here's, here's one down at the bottom here that I've enlarged to show you that they made it with dots as well as with the firm uh, arrow shape. So there's the chunky stone that we have in Kentucky, rather hard evidence because there isn't anybody on earth that could have faked this. I'm the first one that ever heard of it and they found that in 1939. Archaeologists found it, uh, Webb from the University of Kentucky. So, okay, that's how they use the stone you see here to, as, a, as a whirl to manufacture cloth and of course the mummies that they found all over Kentucky had a woven cloth that was manufactured somehow. Now we think possibly we know how. Here's a Frenchman that came down out of Manitoba, uh, Canada, and he found the Mandan Indians because he'd heard there were Welsh-speaking Indians and sure enough they were Welsh-speaking Indians. But isn't it interesting, they wore a cross and they spoke the name Jesus and Mary. A little strange for Indians, right? 1735. Now, I mentioned William Webb's name. He was a professor and head of the archaeology department at the University of Kentucky. He found these strange things up the river at, <clears throat> at near where Portsmouth is today. And uh, it's called a Hardin Village site. It's on the Ohio River. This stone here is drawn out here. You see we have a circle with a cross in it. We have a British-looking cross here. And we have the Alwyn sign in dots on the stone. Here's the actual piece and you'll notice that the the uh, cross is entirely surrounded uh, by the circle and that's the way it was back in the fourth fifth century. In fact these are in the graveyards over there and you'll see how the cross got away and came out beyond about 700s. There's a fourth fifth and 700 cross. So we kind of got a peg on when these people came. Here it is in, in a mound down in, in uh, Georgia. 
<coughs> in a hand, which is also a symbol we don't have time to go into. This is a beautiful thing that was found also by Webb in 1939 at the Hardin Village site. Again, a Celtic cross, if you will. And if you look closely, there is a second ring here that goes all the way around. It's been chipped off. There's also three chevrons on all of these chevrons here. And there's an alphabet up here. A little strange for Indians to independently invent something like this on this continent. But when we looked at the, <clears throat> at the family crests of all of the kings of Britain, here are all of the 12 tribes. Amazing how this got into the culture of the British people. But you also see that the kings of the Morgan were in fact chevrons. Neat. Then we find up the river some banner stones, some kind of something. We don't know exactly what they are, but here you've got the three chevrons again, some going up, some going down. Here's another piece in the home of the sheriff, chief of police up there, and uh, amazing. But there's an E-A, and I told you before, that's their god. It's Ea, came to earth in an egg, half fish, half man. That's what was on they found armor plating at the falls of the Ohio. They said there was a harp and a mermaid. It wasn't a mermaid, it was a fish god. And it was the Chaldean god that came out, got into some of the Hebrew stuff. This is also in his collection. That is an A and that is an E. There's other letters on it. We didn't even see it until we photographed it and blew it up. It's in, the, uh, in his home up there. Absolute, absolutely authentic, because I'm the first one that knew about this alphabet. This is also in the chief's uh, collection. I plopped this on the <clears throat> table at the British Museum and asked the archaeologist, Dr. Youngs, I said, what does that look like to you? We're finding things like this over in Kentucky. And she looked at that and she says, yeah, I think that's a distributor. <laughs> so anyway, here's, uh, here's what we find. This is eastern Kentucky. And uh, <clears throat> if you go up the Ohio River, You'll see up here, there's, there was writing up here. You saw the crosses and the letters we found here. At Charleston, writing. Writing at Brandenburg. Then mummies found. And in these three locations, those mummies had cloth and deerskin wrappers. Writing found here, and there's other writing all around this area. In Sneedville, there were Melungeons. Okay, they Sneedville in this whole valley area. And then 26 miles away at Bat Creek, there was some writing, which you'll see in a little bit. This is what a Melungeon looked like in 1820. They were white. They tried to keep them from voting by telling them that they were Indian or that they were black. Couldn't do it. But they did say that they were Christian. Okay, this is a, a five-factor blood study done by Tennessee anthropologists in spring of 1990. <clears throat> and you'll notice that the correlation in the blood factors with the Melungeons, it's Libya, Canary Islands, Portugal, that's the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, Cyprus, Spain, Wales is a close hit, but the American Indians appear to be the complete opposite blood factors. The Melungeons do not appear to be American Indians. Now, Prehistoric Men of Kentucky, written by Colonel Bennett Young, Wilson Club, 1910, talks about uh, finding in 1776, now that's three years before the first log cabin was built in Lexington, finding some mummies in a cave, and they were processed by some town. This was not reported by Raffinesque, but Raffinesque, our first uh, professor of history uh, at, the, uh, at Transylvania College, reported all the other mummies. And <clears throat> in Scotland, in the archives of Scotland, is this letter goes back to 1815 by a Dr. Mitchell written to the Earl of Buchan and he talks about these mummies found at two different locations and sure enough when we went back we compared this letter to the actual newspaper article and they were absolutely correct all the way. They did have, they did have deer skins wrapped around them. They did have a cloth. They, uh, the skin looked like dried bacon. Up here, one of them had a fine linen shirt on. Amazing. Indians in fine linen shirts. Should have been a dead giveaway. Wasn't. Okay, these are the mummies then that came out of Kentucky. The first short cave, it's about eight miles out of uh, Mammoth Cave. 
All those mummies are gone except for Fawn Hoof. Fawn Hoof is in the Smithsonian Institute. We have a request working for a year now for DNA and for carbon dating on her. Uh, Scudder's mummy. Oh, here's a, here's a, here's a dead giveaway. Uh, one of the mummies that showed up in the literature, 1835, uh, with, this was uh, <clears throat> written by Josiah Priest, and it says that the mummy down in Florida had an alphabet on it that looked exactly like the letters that they had seen in the, in the British Isles on metal. Now, if they had followed this clue up, it would have made all of our research redundant because here's the clue that would have given it all away. And again, cloth manufactured from the bark of trees. This is Scudder's mummy, went to Scudder's Museum and was burned up in P.T. Barnum's circus about 20 years later. It's gone, but Raff and S do this and it would make a good book cover. This is Fawn Hoof's skull. It's in the Smithsonian Institute. We did a craniometric examination because American Indians have three plates, three sutures and three Inca bones, they call them. And those Inca bones differentiate all those people that came across the Bering Strait, Mongolian bloodline, with the Caucasians. Well, she didn't have those, those bones, but they said, oh, well, we found a lot of these too. So that doesn't mean anything. We were looking particularly at the teeth because the teeth would have large pulp chambers. All the Asian people have large pulp chambers. But unfortunately, the front teeth, which would have been shoveled if they had been American Indian, scooped out, if you feel back in there, they were missing. They were on this mummy when she went up there because we've got the writing, they were intact and in good shape, but those are the first teeth that go that only have one root. Anyway, there she is, and we hope to get a carbon dating on her. There's enough tissue. This is the turn of the century, a photograph of her, named Fawn Hoof because of the little hooves that she had around her neck. Then we sent some of the messages over to Wales and in, in hoping that if the Welsh-speaking Indians had an alphabet that we could identify some of the things that we found in Kentucky that had writing on them. And Alan Wilson did that and Alan Wilson will now come up and tell us. Well, there's his book, incidentally. We've got five or six copies if somebody is interested. In Thank you. Federally mechanized, am I? Um, what do I do with this? Is that backward? That, 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 that. Uh, I don't know. I've got two hands. Uh, I'm going to start off by going in the wrong direction. But bear with me because it may pay off. Uh, I started looking at the history of Southeast Wales about 35 years ago in the hobby. And my reason for starting to look at it was that I didn't believe in anything I was called in school. Uh, uh, so well, you okay? okay? Thank you. Right, I'll start again. I, I looked at the history of Southeast Wales, and I started looking at casually as a hobby, you know, things to do on a winter weekend and so on because I didn't believe anything I'd ever been told about it in school. Uh, it's a neglected area, a neglected subject, and I've later found out that it's a, it's a forbidden subject. One does not look into the history of Southeast Wales. It's very strange because it's the best recorded and most detailed recorded in the whole of Europe. And it's the best backed up by physical evidence. By that I mean uh, Dark Age inscribed stones with people's names on, names of kings and princes and what they do. There are over 200 in Wales. Uh, named battlefields with big grave mounds of the dead, all the names around the place sorting things out. Ancient churches going back to the dawn of the Christian era. Ancient manors and forts and heaven knows what. And a massive record in different forms. Lives of saints, genealogies of saints, the genealogies of the kings, the written history, historical poetry, the triads, everything sort of interlocking, charters of the land of the cathedral, going back to about the year 400, on to about 1100, abbey charters and so on. And the charters are important because the king gives the charter to the church and all the princes and his family line up and sign as well and 
his brother the bishop or his son the bishop and all the leading clergy do the same. So you've got a who's who down the century. And everything seems to interlock and to fit together. What seems to have happened is this. The British claim two places of origin. They claim a migration coming in from Syria. And the Syrian migration obviously is a very early one. It takes place around 1600 BC, right? Now, if that is correct, there is a Syrian population moving into Britain at the dawn of the Bronze Age. The reason for moving into Britain is very clear. If you've got tin, you can make bronze. You have bronze weapons, which are infinitely superior to copper weapons. So it seems to be militaristic. At the same time as this invasion is said to take place, a vast explosion took place in Britain of what they call the Wessex culture. Marvellous metalworking emerged everywhere. They find it in ancient tombs and mounds and gardens where, and it has no sort of base, no pedigree. It seems to come out of the blue, out of nowhere. The second migration takes place around 500 BC, and it's said to come from Troy, and the British have always claimed to be Trojans. And this was happily accepted until the beginning of the 19th century. Then people in Oxford had bright ideas and they said, hang about a minute, Troy is a fiction. It never existed other than in the mind of Homer. And if Troy is a complete fiction, the history of a people who claim to be descended from Troy has also to be a fiction. So you have to get rid of this history and throw it out. And an onslaught developed on this history. People ran about making huge reputations say, I have disproved this manuscript and I have disproved that manuscript. Of course, they hadn't disproved anything. What they're really inviting us to believe is that for about 1,200 years, several thousand writers, bards, monks, historians, all combined together over 1,200 years, spread over about 30,000 square miles of territory, to produce a vast, interlocking, totally credible forgery, which would fill a library, and does. And they backed this forgery up with skeletons in stone coffins, with inscribed tombstones that are known to be 1600, even 1700 in some cases, years old. They backed it up with battlefields, with graves with thousands of dead in, etc. In other words, something has gone wrong. So my colleague and I finally decided we'd look into this properly and in some detail. Now, the way to go about it, we decided, was to see if we could track back on the migration stories. Now, there is in South Wales an ancient alphabet known as the Cauldron. Now, generally, it was written on wood. They made a wooden frame, put triangular slats of wood across, and they cut into the slips of wood with a little axe or a knife. So obviously the entire alphabet is a straight stroke alphabet. Can't have any curves. Had the advantages that even if your sight was going or you were in the dark, you could read it. It's like a braille. This has been noted. Again, when they threw the general history out and said, all this history is a big forgery, they also decided that the Cauldron alphabet was a big forgery. So out of the window went the alphabet or the theory of the alphabet. Uh, the idea developed that it had been invented around the year 1800, which is <coughs> remarkable really because there are books of 1580 and earlier and 1520 exhibiting the Cauldron alphabet. And I don't want to bore you too much with that, but I can assure you that the proof is enormous. So what we were doing was something against the trend with academia. The academics were in one direction and we were tending to go in the other. We found that, that there were cauldron inscribed stones in Wales, they were in England, dug up in London, they were in the north of England, they were in Scotland, all over the place. And so we decided that if they were the Welsh alphabet, and a man named Llewellyn Sean had preserved the cipher to the alphabet in 1560, then we would know which sign was A, B, C, D, E. Therefore, if we had an inscription, all we had to do was look at the sign, place the appropriate letter underneath, 
and if we went along the inscription we should come up with a word and this is what happened and so we had Welsh words and for an English person all you have to do is look up the word in the dictionary and if you've got an English Welsh dictionary which is easy to acquire and lo and behold you can read what's on the stone uh, some of the first we did one was of a stone known to have been erected around 950 and it said Higuel Rex well Higuel Rex in all the manuscripts is Higuel Rex and he's Howell the Good who died in 948 and his grave mound is about three miles from this stone and his court is about six miles off what's left of his court it's upper court farm and lower court farm we found another one uh, had a floral cross on the top figure of a man below carrying a sword in one hand scepter in the other his inscription below it said Godufan the exile we looked up the records Godufan the exile is there it says Godufan was a turbulent mad and wild king for which reason he was deposed and exiled and his brother Fran placed in his stead and this proved to be the pattern right around Britain everywhere we looked we found a stone we could read it and it always had some correct historical credibility so we were encouraged to think that we now were on something of a winner we then found that there were even books in the Welsh National Library wholly written in Colburn um, some of them with 6th century poems and so on <coughs> So the idea that it was a forgery was rapidly going right out of the window. What we then decided to do was to check back on the migration legends. Oh, the thing. Have I got the right end of this, Jim? Shake it. Shake it a little. No, no. It works if you shake it, is it? Yeah. The migration legend, the second one that we took, started here. And the people journeyed around here. And they actually stopped off in Spain picked up three groups of their countrymen, went out to the UK, okay? We also noted that coming out of here, Troy, about a hundred years before this, the Etruscans had moved out of the area and they'd moved into Italy and set up the Etruscan Empire. So it seemed to us possible that we'd have an alphabet in Britain, possibly here, probably here, and here. Because if these people move, it's highly likely that they took the language with them and their alphabet with them. And we also knew that Pliny the Elder had said that the Raetians up in Switzerland, around here, were Etruscans who had moved north. So there's a chance there. What we then found was that there were a massive inscription here, there were a massive array of inscription here, some up here, and quite a few over here. And they all appeared to be in the same alphabet. Now somebody had anticipated this, a man named John Williams of Oxford in 1846 had said, isn't it strange that we find this Colburn Welsh alphabet all over Etruria, the Etruscan Empire, and all over Phrygia in Turkey. Because he didn't say it too loudly, he published it because again, he's swimming against the tide. Everybody's saying this history's terrible, it's all forged, it's no good, don't look at it. And he's looking at it. So we began to try to translate the inscriptions in Etruria and logically we, we started off with bronze mirrors that only have one or two words on them no problem there, they were reading up there's a fellow leaning over a, an altar carving something up and it says sacrifice you know, things like that and we started looking at little longer things uh, little inscriptions on jugs wine jars, things like that on the statue where there's a gladiator looking awfully sad with all his armor broken up and the goddess has got an arm around him, you know. And it says that how he's fallen down and has passed over. That is the traditional word for dying. And he's seeking refuge and succor from the goddess, you know. So we then knew we could read Etruscan. Uh, we tackled the largest uh, inscriptions we could find and are known in Etruria. One is the Perugia Kipus, about 36 lines of right. Another one is the uh, Persi tablets, three gold tablets, one in Carthaginian, Punic, and two in Etruscan. And they were found at the port of Carrera near Rome there. And uh, they told a credible story. They told of a league, apparently, between Carthage and Etruria. Carthage is here, Etruria here. And what had happened is that when Cyrus, the emperor of Persia, got on the throne about 546 BC, he sent his general Harpagus along the coast here and Harpagus' job was to clean up all the Greek cities and most of them submitted and he came to the Pokeans and he said look knock down one tower of your wall 
give us one house in the city for the emperor and everything will be alright. They said, give us 24 hours to think it over. So he said, fine. Next morning he came along with his army and he found that the entire town had taken to the ships with all their women, children, everything, everything he could carry and had gone away. The Phokians sailed away, tried to get land here, couldn't get it, came round to Sardinia. And they thought it would be a very good idea to set up as pirates. So they set up as pirates and they traded on, on preying on the Etruscan fleets here and the Carthaginian fleet, the merchant fleet. <coughs> So a league was formed between Carthage and Etruria to provide 60 ships each, a war fleet, to track down these Phokians and destroy them, which they did. And the Phokians were driven over there and they finished up here in Sicily. But that's what these tablets tell you in Welsh. I'm calling it Welsh because it's probably Cumbric, right? We tackled the Agnoni tablet from the Adriatic coast which told of the origin of these people, how they come to be in Etruria. I'll tell you that later if you like. So we're fairly confident we could deal with this. We tackled the few Rydian inscriptions and they work out as well, no problem. So we then moved further back in time and we got over to, to Turkey, tackled some of the inscriptions there. Primarily the longest one we could get our hands on was the inscription over the supposed tomb of Midas. And that turns out to translate perfectly logically very well in the same technique, reading in the same language. So what we've got is a language coming from the east to the west, dying out in the east, dying out in, in Etruria, which is known to have died out there, and if you read Pliny and others, they'll say how Etruscan is totally different from Latin. There's no comparison, it's totally different from Greek. So it's died out in the Mediterranean areas, but it's been preserved around there in Wales. This is the situation we have. This is the background then, against which we're working when we get an approach from Jim Michael. And he says to us, you know, can you assist us? Do you know what this alphabet might be? And we say, yeah, sure, <laughs> we know what it is. So while he's pressurizing us to sort of look west, we're saying to him, go away, we're going east. We're, we're having to a roots exercise, you think we're going backwards. And we've gone a lot further, won't bore you with it, but we've got back to about 2000 BC. And all of it seems to fit in with the known histories. What am I? Okay. When we were approached by Jim Michael, uh, we supplied him with a little bit of information. Now what we found in the history of Wales is what has been taught in the schools until about 1920, 1922. All the children in Wales were taught Arthur, son of King Myrick, grandson of King Tudric, great-grandson of King Tyfel, etc., where he lived, where they were all buried, all this was going on. There was a centralization gradually of education in Wales from about 1860 onwards, which culminated in the 1920s, and everybody had to be taught the same thing. I don't know whether the English government were motivated by the Irish Rising of 1916 and 1922, which frightened them, but history is a powerful weapon, it's a powerful political tool. And there are no textbooks in Wales to teach children Welsh history at this moment. There aren't any. No child is taught any Welsh history other than the bit the teacher might know. So they learn all about William the Conqueror in England and Magna Carta, and they don't learn really their own stuff. So we told him what we thought would start him off. Uh, there's, if you read the, say, the life of Brendan, it starts off, and Brendan heard of the voyage of the Tairn. It means, and Brendan heard of the voyage of the monarch. That's what it means. And Brendan also wished to visit this uh, great land across the oceans or whatever. And they said to Brendan, you will not get there in a boat made of skins. You must go to the men who make ships of timber. So he did. And they agreed to make him a ship of wood. And some of the men who made the ship agreed to sail with him to show him the way. Now, if they're going to show him the way, you've got to ask yourself a question. And you've got to also ask, who was the monarch at the time? Well, if you're talking about the British monarch, then you're talking about Arthur, son of Myrick, grandson of Theodoric. That's what you're talking about. Charlie Sinat Henu is well known to be head bad at the court of Arthur. No doubt about that. 
Taliesin means high intellect. Penug is a saint in Gwent in South Wales. There's two churches of Penug still surviving there. And Penug advised uh, the author of the life of St. Samson how to write it around the year 600. Okay? Samson being a nephew of Arthur Glamorgan. What we didn't know was that there was some hiatus about Manic because we had stopped our studies around the year 1100 because we said, look, we're going backwards in time, not forwards in time. We're doing a little bit of what Alex Haley did in his roots. <coughs> we didn't want to come forward, we wanted to go backwards. Our assumption was that Maddock had been correctly dated around 1170. There was so much written about him by so many people that you would anticipate they'd done their homework. So we said, Maddock, is, that's what's known at the moment. Well, it's a problem, because um, we knew uh, in 1983 that Arthur had sailed west on the Western Ocean around 574. We knew that, because the evidence is monumental. There's not one source, there's dozens. And here we had this Maddox e effort, so we said send us some information. Well, we were sent a book by a gentleman in America on Maddox. We looked at it in an effort to trace Maddox for him. And we threw up our hands in dismay and said, you know, this is ridiculous. What do we do? And the only thing we could think to do was to go back to square one and start from a scratch position with it, which is almost what happened. Uh, there were wild statements, you know, nobody knows where Ely is. Wow. It's a big district in Cardiff, 60,000 people live there. Nobody knows who William Fleming was. Wow. He was the high chef for Cardiff. Nobody knows where Mark lived and so on. And we said, this is, this is absurd, we've got to get this to square one. So we really began to look at Maddock again just a couple of years ago. And we found that he's harder to miss than he is to find. And that's not an exaggeration. What have we got here? What has happened in the middle of the 6th century in Britain is one of the best recorded efforts in history. Again, multiple sources, at least a dozen lives of saints in the histories, in the prophecies of Ere, all over the place. A great comet or other body from outer space struck Britain. Right? It devastated the entire country right across the south of Britain and appears to have affected parts of Ireland. It may be the reason why the Scots moved out of Northern Ireland, crossed over and went to the Western Scotland. They were originally in Ireland because that's what they did at that time. The records are very clear that most of the country had to be evacuated. People fled to the southwestern tip of Britain, Cornwall, they fled to Ireland and they fled to their kinsmen in Brittany and Ludow, which later became Normandy. Huge areas could not be lived in for at least seven and sometimes until eleven years. This is probably the origin of the romance stories of Arthurian knights entering the great wastelands which you'll find peppered all over the romance tales. What has happened is that independent of us, fortunately, Oxford University Astrophysics Department in the person of this gentleman, Dr. Victor Klub, has come to the same conclusion, that a comet struck Britain in the middle of the 6th century. Place names everywhere actually indicate that it did. So we've got records in the lives of the saints, we've got them in the triads, we've got them in the histories, we've got them in the ancient poetry, we've got it everywhere. Comet strikes Britain. It seems to have had a similar effect to the disasters in Egypt at the time of Moses. The birds died, the animals died, uh, that's the farm animals and the wild, the reptiles died, the fish in the rivers died, people died, the plants died, nothing lived. All the buildings were shaken, it says, to the very foundations, the roofs fell in. This is probably why all the Roman cities and towns in Britain were totally ruined. Whereas they've survived, in some cases, in very good state in France and, and Italy and North Africa. But they were shaken to pieces in Britain. Uh, it must have been awesome, and Oxford University, not us, estimate the blast to be something equivalent to a hundred Hiroshima atom bombs. This is what happened. When it happened, Maddock, Maddock Morflam, is the fleet admiral and is at sea. And he gets blasted out by the huge tornadoes and waves and winds, and he doesn't know where he is. He comes back after ten years when a lot of people have begun to return to the country, including the king. Because the king took the army out of the country and planted it in 
Ludo, later Normandy. And he took the army with him because he knew he might have to fight his way back in. Maddox comes back after 10 years and they say, where have you been? Because you can't stay at sea for 10 years, your ship will fall apart, you can't live. So he promptly told them of this wonderful, huge, vast land he'd been in, where hardly anybody lived. And it says quite clearly in one record, he was ridiculed because they couldn't follow his star directions. Obviously they used the stars as people did through all ages for navigation. So they send out an admiral named Gwenon. All I'm doing is telling you what's in the record. And Gwenon came back and said, he's right, it's there. So now they hold a big council. And the king calls all the government in and they have a parley and see what they'll do. And they decide this is an act of God. Because their country has been destroyed, God has shown them another country. That's what he says. And there's one long poem between Arthur, son of Uther, and Fluflod, son of Marek, son of Uther. So that makes Arthur and Marek both sons of Uther, therefore brothers, and Fluflod is Arthur's nephew. Interesting, because Fluflod means coloured man. It doesn't mean black man, it means brown man. I find that astonishing. And the thing goes on through about 40 verses of poetry where first Arthur asks questions and the other guy answers him. And the king can't understand how there is such a vast country with nobody guarding it. No coast guards, no kings protecting their rights. Are they Christians? Do they have cities? You know, question and answer. And he finally decides that he will sail for this country. We have so far located, I think, four ancient records and a further six medieval records of the fleet. And he assembled 700 ships in Milford Haven, that's in the west of Wales, and they sailed the Western Ocean for this country. So it was three voyages, first Maddox by accident, checked out by the Admiral, and then the King sails with Maddox and others. And they also brought a man named Ammon with him, who was the King's brother-in-law. The tales go on and they say how the King was in America, or we assume it's America, for four years he is assassinated by a naked savage. And I find that very difficult to place in Western Europe. They wrap, three ladies of the court wrap the king's body in leather, deer skins, three of them. They place his armor on him so the people will recognize him because they dry wither him, which is a form of mummification. They dry him out, obviously. And they place him in a boat and seven men begin a celebrated voyage, which is enumerated time and time again. And this celebrated voyage brings him back. Well, we already knew the other end of the voyage because we had several records, very, very clear ones, in great detail, of a ship arriving at the mouth of the Aweni River in South Wales with a body in a bag, and they put it in a boat, a leather bag, take it up river to Sinildid, who is a first cousin of this King Arthur, and he takes it into a cave and they plop the body in the cave for a while. If you go into that cave, which is still there, obviously, there is a pit running east and west, it's well into the cave, and it's about 11 feet long, very squared off, three feet, three and a half feet wide, about three and a half feet deep, man-made in granite, and you wouldn't do that much work for a peasant. Later, they take the king out and they bury him on a hill near, nearby in a church, and the church is easily identifiable from many records. So, it, it's rather an odd circumstance, where did the ship come from has bothered everybody for centuries, right? Okay, where are we going with this? Right. We already knew something about this one because everybody had spotted this. They said, they do not know the brindled ox, thick his headband, seven score knobs on his collar. They're describing a brown ox with a mane, which, in my opinion, can only be the American buffalo. And here are the seven men. When we went with Arthur of anxious memory, seven, except seven, none returned to Guy Van Huh? The famous poem is called Predi Anun, it means the voyage to the other world, and they constantly alluded to the other world. Medieval people couldn't understand all this, and they thought the other world was a mystic fairyland in the, what they call, Celtic imagination. Bit odd, because we've already seen that the Welsh weren't Celts, they were Chaldeans, and they've never claimed to be Celts. But when they decided very blandly in England in the early 1800s to get rid of Welsh history because they were Trojans and Troy hadn't existed. Of course, 
<laughs> later on, Henrik Schleiman found Troy. And of course things took an about turn, but nobody bothered to reverse the decision. So they had to give a label to them, so they stuck Kelch on their neck, it's suitable, it'll do. And this is what appears to be happening. Okay, let's go on a bit. In order you get in the picture, I've drawn this little chart view. You can see Arthur the, Arthur the Black, hang on, let's go back a minute. Arthur the Black, he's the son of Magnus Maximus, right? Uh, 383, Magnus was in Britain, married Helen, the second wife son of the king Eudat, Octavius, and they invaded France in 383. It's a well-known history. His chief general was known to the Romans as Andragathius, but he's Arthur, Arthur the First. They seized Paris, he seized the Lady Guinevere, Genevieve, Saint Genevieve, uh, fought a big battle with the Roman Emperor Gratian at Soissons, 12 miles south of Paris in 383, defeated him, chased him down to Lyons, said to Gratian, Let's call it a day. Let's have a banquet. Gratian comes to the banquet. Arthur cuts him in half with an axe. Magnus then becomes emperor of the West. Spain goes over to them, all of North Africa, fights their way through, through uh, Switzerland, down into Italy. That's why there is a carving of Arthur besieging a city in Modena Cathedral, you see, showing all the characters engaged in this expedition of 383. Down to Italy they go, Another carving of Arthur, a mosaic in Taranto, in the cathedral there, crosses over into the Balkans and Greece, and he fights two big battles with the Emperor Theodosius of Constantinople in 388. So you've got a real live Arthur doing the things the medieval says, fighting the Romans. The problem in later times was people said... How can Arthur fight the Romans and fight the Saxons? He's 250 years old. This is ridiculous. Well, it's not. He's two people. You see? They've welded Arthur the first in with Arthur the second, on the bottom, who fights the Angles and Saxons. And by welding them together into one gigantic thing, they caused the problem. Once you read the Welsh records, you sort them out with ease. And they're not a problem. And they both figure quite prominently, correctly in the history. Right. Let's get on a bit. See where we're going. I've put this one in because when in about 920, a fellow named Owen, the son of Howell Zah, Howell the Good, who I mentioned before, his name's on Colbrin on a monument, 948. Around 920, Owen is getting married, so they drew up all the necessary king wrists to prove all his ancestry and pedigree and marriage to all the other kings. The list of the kings of the West Midlands contains at the bottom, hang on, let's get back, a very interesting statement. It actually tells you where Glastonbury is. <laughs> it says this Glastonbury is, is called, it's called Lightkite, Litchfield. This is a bit of a shaker because it means that Glastonbury is 200 miles from where people think it is. And Glaston's in Cornish and in Bretton is oak trees. Also Derwin and Glaston's is Welsh for oak but also Glastenen is the Scarlet Oak. And there's a long pedigree to this, but people have been looking in the wrong place because Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset wasn't founded until 942. So a little bit of history there. It does tell you what perhaps has been going on and how a bit of mayhem has been going on with the history. Okay? So what we've got basically here is Marek is at sea, about 562, Gregory of Tours tells how the two great islands in the ocean, Gregory of Tours <coughs> was in France, French nobleman and abbot. He writes the history of the Franks, he's alive at the time, okay? His history still exists in great detail. He mentions how the two great islands in, in the ocean were smashed to pieces, set on fire from end to end, and people had to flee from them. So we've got a contemporary reference from another source outside the UK. Maddox at sea, Comet strikes Britain, okay? Uh, Jim, you can't spell Britain. Uh, 572, ten years later, Maddox returns to Britain. 573, the Admiral verifies it. And 574, the King sails to the other world. It's what the Spanish call the New World. They call it the Other World. The King is killed and mummified 578. He's returned 579. 
put an unmarked tomb, but it's well described in the Songs of the Graves. It's in great detail. They name the field. And in Bond 580, Merlin, who is Taliesin, several references to Merlin, he is, for I am Taliesin, means high intellect, and men shall call me Merlin, right? And he also says, for I am Merlin, and men shall call me Taliesin. Merlin actually is Merlin, it means little horse. These people are Gnostic Christians, and little horse is the sort of power appointed by God, Sabaoth, to control benignly the world with intelligence and with enlightenment. So Beoth is enlightenment, little horse is enlightenment. So what he's saying, well I am Merlin, for I am enlightened. And men shall call me Talies, and men shall call me high, high intellect. And the king is later buried out of the out of the cave into St. Peter's Church at Kaikarara. And it's well known there are 168 histories in England that say that he's buried at Kaikarara. You know all you've got to do is find Kaikarara, it's not hard. Okay? What have we got here? Um, yeah, most of the writing in Colburn was done on sticks. They didn't often write on stone. But fortunately for us, they did enough of it for us to prove it and check it out. There's one stone in, in London actually dug up in St. Paul's Cathedral Churchyard, and Arthur is always associated in the Romance stories with stones in St. Paul's Cathedral Churchyard for some reason or other. And that stone tells how uh, the country is in a fallen and rotten and terrible decayed state. And it also says that the king intends to take a voyage. And it ties in with the prophecies of Ere, the prophecies of towards that which is beyond, which they constantly call this place where we are now. And on that stone there, there are clear messages which tie in and there is a, well it's, it's a carving, which clearly indicates the great dragon that they identified as the comet. So they wrote mainly on stone. The interesting thing is that tracing things backwards, we got back, as you remember, from Britain to Etruria, back to the Turkish area. These people were coming through Asia Minor, Turkey, at the very time that another group of the same group were coming through, known to the Greeks as the Chimeroi. And in Herodotus, they're the Chimerians. Herodotus was writing histories from 460 BC. Apparently, these are the people who were planted in northern Assyria by the kings of Assyria and in the various libraries of emperors of Assyria that were dug up by Layard, the archaeologist. They're mentioned and, well, they're not just mentioned, they're described as the Cymry, K-H-U-M-R-Y, the Cymry. The Cymry took off, if you read the second book of Esdras, the apocryphal book, and they moved westwards. Apparently, when the mayhem was going on in the Assyrian Empire, with the murder of the emperor by two of his sons. And they moved westwards, across the Euphrates, across the other branch of the Euphrates, and into Asia Minor. So there's a trace of these Cymri becoming the Chimeroi or Chimerians, moving into this Trojan area around 650 BC. It's a very strange thing, but the Welsh are not the Welsh. That's an English word. It means strangers in High German. They call themselves the Cymri, K-H-U-M-R-Y. No different. And their language traces all the way back. Other strange thing is if you find the Bible and, and go through the Bible, you'll find a dozen or more references that are one or two on the bottom of this page here from Ezekiel and from Numbers. And it says, Son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, and then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph. The other one says from Numbers, Take every one of them a rod, write thou every man's name upon his rod. And we all remember how Aaron throws down his rod, doesn't he? In Fort Pero, and it conquers the two rods of the uh, Egyptian priests. They used to write on sticks too. So this writing on sticks is also recorded by the, the Hittites used to do it. Uh, this little alphabet was drawn up for Welsh school children in the 1800s by a couple of teachers. And you can see you've got at the bottom the Colburn alphabet, or A version of it. And you've also got above it, Ogham. And at the very top, you've got the Arwen sign, from which all these letters are derived. And Jim Michaels told you about that, how it appears on uh, everything everywhere. In Britain, it's on every government office, tax offices, Department of Agriculture offices, any jail they build, any army place, every piece of military equipment. So state cipher. 
and it's on documents of state signed by the king as far back as 1250 and probably earlier. It's a state sign. There we go. That's a stone. Uh, where's this one from? Let me think now. Uh, Creek, that's Grave Creek, yeah. The interesting thing is it's obviously in, in a, a Calvin alphabet. It's unmistakable and you have the Christian cross on the bottom. That's the most significant feature of it. And the statement ties up very well. Readable Welsh. Uh, that's the alphabet as preserved by John Williams and by Llewellyn Shaw. Llewellyn Shaw in 1560, John Williams published it in 1846. As you can see, he says, isn't it a little remarkable, all the above comprised with four to five exceptions, all the old Etruscan or Pelasgic, he really means Phrygian letters, which were probably but little different from Greek characters used in the time of Caesar. When Julius Caesar landed in the UK, he wrote his wars as he went along, you know, to extol himself, and he said, the British letters are very similar to the Greek. Ammianus Marcellinus, another Roman writer, says, the Greeks got their letters from the British. A bit outlandish. And there is, of course, the ancient story of Abaris, the Druid, going to Greece around the year 650 and teaching the Greeks. You never know. Again, this is published in 1906 by uh, a lady, and there's Evans, and she again exhibits variants of these alphabets as the thing was being mutilated a little because they were mixing it with Latin in the Dark Ages. Okay? This is an inscription again from an overhang which I think is known as the pig pen in Kentucky. There's a guy who keeps pigs under this overhang, it's not quite a cave. You can see the Arwen sign, you can see a tomb mound, and you can see it's an inscription which is part of a larger inscription and it tells how they're crying out from the tomb. Again, more of that inscription from the pig pen. We have to translate and decipher the entire thing. No problem, there it is. That's another one, carbon inscription in America. This is a covenant inscription. It actually says, on the bottom, I'll translate it to you. To what strength to divide the land we are spread over purely, justly, between our offspring in wisdom. So in order to be strong, we will stay you know, united and we'll divide the land between each other and we'll see that our offspring get fair shares. Huh? Uh, what would you call it? A uh, Bill of Rights? <laughs> I don't know, maybe a Declaration of Independence. It's, in the it's a constitution, right? It's in the Library of Council. Yeah, well it exists. Sir. This is a little stone that was found under the head of a man who was clearly a very important man in a very large grave mound. I think it's a bat tree. Uh, that's it, Timothy. Right. He had some bracelets which are believed to be not of American sort of provenance in that they are smelted metal and therefore they're copper and other alloyed metal bracelets which apparently are of European smelting style. He did apparently have some wooden plugs with him, circular plugs, which have been carbon dated which fetches around the 6th century and I can remember getting a letter from Jim Michael sitting down with my colleague and we said, what's he got to say this time, you know? The fellow might was getting a pest. And we sat down and looked at it and we deciphered it, deciphered that stone. And we'd had photographs of it sent to us and we said, he's got it upside down. <laughs> we turned it the other way around and we could read it. It actually says the ruler Maddock he is, or what's that effect? So it would appear that the man in this mound was named Maddock. Okay? Fairly important man from the size of the mound, so I'm told, and with the bits and pieces with it. Big tall man, bigger than the average Indian, about six feet, which you'd expect. And that's a nephew of Jim Michaels holding the stone. There you go again. Maddock, he is, thou art the ruler, distinctly thou art the ruler. That's how it actually translates. That's another stone, uh, obviously. It, uh, I'm not sure how to say this, it, it, it's, it's difficult to go with Welsh syntax. An Englishman will say, you're a clever lad, but a Welshman will say, there is a clever lad, you are. The syntax is, is backward speak, it, it's all over the place. It's not the same syntax as we would use in English. But it says, pure and fresh, sure and certain, the great flood to follow, that we think of the to render a strait. They're going through a strait on a narrow confined pass of water, so they're going to try for the head of the Atlantic free and large ample space we're sailing either with Uther or Uther actually means wonderful so 
with uh, taking off uh, he what is pervading these are just some lines from a, a very very long poem of several hundred lines um, by Taliesin it means uh, Taliesin I went for a while Taliesin so he went for a while came back and it says repetitively through the poem brought back I mean they're bringing somebody back through fog and mist the chief wolf of heaven Arthur is frequently alluded to as the chief wolf of heaven uh, in the time to gather harvest we know roughly when he's due in uh, brought back to thine fair passage through the seas right the seas through brought back from Ere and they're always referring to this distant place across the western ocean as Ere to the churchyard on the brink in shore where the influence of, it, it was brought to the Eweni estuary in the longer estuary of the river brought back the knight upon golden armor bearing three accounts say he's got his golden armor on one account also says there's a gold face mask we don't know brought back in mind and thought with atonement to give extreme unction so they, they brought him back perhaps to settle the uh, succession to the throne and if you don't bring him back it could be mayhem as it was going to take the king brought back born conveyed the leather bag courteous what is best for me the singer musician artist that's him Brought back in summer with slow mild long days. Brought back to a solitary spot in deerskin, salved or embalmed. And then they say, brought back, applied with salve, they've embalmed him, and brought back as a fish in his proceeding. In other words, like a fish in the bottom of a boat. Now this is a, gives you a little flavour of it. We can't obviously not tell you, because these poems run into hundreds of lines and go into fantastic detail. But it gives you an idea of, of what's going on. So what we've got is a bit of final proof, as Jim would call it. If there's anything I've left out or you've got any questions, we'd be very, very happy to try and answer them. So what you've got is really Welsh-speaking Indian, Wallam Olam is their record. Watlam Olam in Welsh means the organisation of everybody. Bit on. We've got the Melungians with blood factors and they're a strange lot. Melungians have got a, a, a I'm called a dulcimer, which is like a, a, a lap half, is it? Not a lap guitar. Well, Identical instruments, identical instruments in Wales, uh, called the creek. I don't know. Uh, metallurgy, forensic dating with fawn hoof, 6th century manuscripts, a mass of them, not one or two, a mass of them. It, it's a celebrated event. And we've got the epigraphics of, the, of decipherment, and we hope to get DNA. And what we're going to try and do is find out if we can get some of the family over there, get a little bit of bone or a little bit of something, DNA it. And we've got a university willing to do it, and if we can get some items over here, if we can get this jawbone of Maddock, which is in the Smithsonian, then a DNA test will link them up and there's no argument. End of story. Carbon testing will help. Do we have some lights? Should we, should we go to lights? Let the dog see the rabbit? Right. If you have any, quest if you have any questions, we, we'll do our best. Because we've covered an awful lot of ground, it's a massive subject, and, and we, we know that we can't really tell you everything. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. How far west supposedly had the Welsh traveled? And the reason I asked is because several of my last year, I saw a report on unsolved mysteries of carbon chemistry. Sure, sure. We found them all the way out in Oklahoma. There were 70,000 of these people, so they could have gone everywhere. Seven. 700 boats, each one holds 100 to 120. They could have had 700, 70,000. And of course they brought animals and other things too. They brought horses for the sake of it. Yes. It's tagged to the Bat Creek Stone. We've got Maddox's name on the Bat Creek Stone. Uh, unfortunately, three years ago when I went up there, they said they had it. I got there. Uh, Secretary of the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association set me up with an interview with the uh, archaeologist, and he said, gee, we've lost it. But they've got something like 40,000 bones tagged in the Smithsonian. I don't think they know what they've got. But we've been consistently asking. We have a work order ready. We have a laboratory standing by to do the DNA and the carbon dating on the mummy. We're not getting very far. They seem to be a little closed-minded up there, but they do want to prove that it's not an American Indian. We've got that going for us because there's a pressure on to bury all the bones that are up there. Neat. 
The Bat Creek is in Loudoun County, Tennessee, and there were uh, several mounds there, and it was dug by archaeologists 1886, and all that stuff was taken to the Smithsonian, and it sat up there in a drawer for years, and that's when we uh, found that that stone, which they thought said Comet for the Hebrews and all that stuff. Words look Hebrew a little bit. Letters look a little like Hebrew, but they were Colburn, and we have massive Colburn now in writing. Ah, a stone with an inscription on it this long that the archaeologists uh, looked at in the 50s and said, uh, made by natural causes. But every, every scratch on it went in the same depth. It's in a straight line, equally spaced. The doggone thing translates. A little hard to defend that it isn't writing. Yeah. Oh. Did you bid on the book? I <laughs> Up here. Yes, sir. Yeah, unfortunately there's no funding for this kind of work. If there were, you know, we'd be right on it. Absolutely, they were Welsh, they were British, no question about it. We find all of the things around that area are British, the forts, the mounds, the whole thing. These people buried their kings. Oh. Let me tell you about the snake. We use serpent mounds, right? There's a couple in Kentucky. There's four in Ohio. There's some in West Virginia. And we heard a fellow down there talking where we were presenting a couple weeks ago or last week down in uh, Columbus, Georgia. And he says, well, he showed all the pictures of these snake mounds. And he says, that's the only place in the world they've got them. And he's going, what's going on on this continent, man? <laughs> you know, a few centuries back, they were all over the place in the British Isles. Don't they know that Patrick, who was a Welsh monk, started out in 434, went up into Ireland to rid Ireland of the snakes? It's all in the legend. There are snakes all over Ireland, but not stone snakes. And he lit his fire in them, and he lit it early in the day, and when the snake worshippers came, it had been desecrated, and he rid Ireland of stone snakes. <laughs> Yes, sir. All the mounds. Now you know. We have a hunch that their measurements were just as accurate as ours. Their days and their times and their clocks and the things they've set up, very accurate, very accurate. They knew that this comet's coming back. I don't know if you saw the paper today or not, but the, somebody said, hey, you know, there's going to be a comet coming back here in, what is it, 2029? He's been predicting a 2015. Uh, Victor Klub uh, is pretty close to that. It's a recurring thing. It says it could wipe out the continent. Uh, it gets a little scary. Hope we got that space telescope up there to see it far enough in advance and use some of those nuclear weapons that they stockpiled in Russia to, to divert it because it's coming. And uh, and those ancients knew it. And the, the comet symbols and the dragon of Britain is the comet all over the old stones that we find. Mind-boggling. We don't ask you to believe this. We ask you to look at it. And uh, Yes. Charlestown, Indiana. That's the stone that you had that you saw there that had Uther's name on it. And uh, what he didn't tell you was at the very top of it, it shows you a picture of a boat, and it has a square box in the boat. Amazing. Had to go through a strait. Had to go through the falls of Ohio's twenty foot drop. Hmm. You can, Seven you people. You interpret the signs around the boat as the two kids that have been newly together. And there's seven dots and seven people at home. Two, uh, in Wales, you've got a lot of duplicate words. You've got, uh, you know, more means the sea, but more means multitude. And then you've got guid means a goose, but guid means uh, cognition, recognition, presence. And you've also got um, many, many of these dual words. And we found that uh, when we were looking further back, about 2000 BC in the east, these things came into play with sort of hieroglyphic signs, right? And therefore the word Dewey means two, 
but Dewey also means the ruler. So whenever you see two, you can often infer, infer the ruler. And that uh, picture actually reads uh, around the boat. One went mutually together with the ruler to pass through mutually together. And there's a boat with a box in it. So whether it, it refers to this body in a box in a boat, I don't know. So that's what Jim is getting at. But that's what it actually said. May I ask a question? Yes. Yes. Killed in yes. 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 Maddox buried here. Okay. Arthur's buried back there because they took him back. Okay, they took him back. But in Why would they take Maddox back? Because he would have been actually possession. He may have been dead ahead, but they took two of his sons back for success. Yeah, there were, there were other sons and there were other brothers of Arthur. He had, uh, he had a brother, St. Paul, a brother, Idnerth, who was murdered, a brother, Freoch who is a Rioch in the life of Symphonian, going to marry the daughter of the king of the Picts. And so there were other people flying around who, who were in the picture. Uh, also, there were sons around. Gwydnerth is mighty in blood. Um, Morgan and Ethel. So, you know, there were other people in, in the frame as well. And Malik was probably better off with a bigger country of his own. Uh, he had apparently one son named Flacky means the glittering one, who was murdered. There, there seemed to be a lot of mayhem going on at the time over the throne. Uh, there's some confusion over whether Morgan and Ethel, who then ruled, uh, are sons of Arthur, but other records clearly indicate they're sons of Marek. And uh, I'm inclined... To, the, the problem is, it's a Welsh word, and they say, ap, it means son of, but they also use it for successor to. So if a brother succeeds a brother on the phone, they say like Howell Ap Reese, but they're actually brothers. But Howell Ap Reese could be son of, you see. And it, it does cause some confusion and, and it's taken a lot of weeding out. But it's highly likely that Morgan, uh, which means begotten overseas, that's what the name means, is, is a son of Maddox. Okay. Amazing. Wouldn't it be nice if Alan can get, can, yeah, just a minute can get Arthur up and bring him to the Falls of the Ohio for a theme park. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, question back here. Yes, we're doing DNA from a son to a father or a grandfather or a brother, whichever we can get to. They're establishing parental uh, responsibilities now in the courts from fathers to sons and assigning parentage uh, all we're doing is a 1500 year old paternity suit <laughs> and uh, but once we've got that you now there's going to be a lot of people throwing stones at us and we're waiting to to have it because they're going to say oh it can't be if you saw the Louisville paper the guy looked for three months and said I really believe there was never a Maddox uh-uh he's a real man we found him we found him in 89 and we knew where he was and we just can't get to him yeah, uh, th this Maddox is, is clearly, you know, a very important man in the 6th century. Uh, cousin of the king is the Bishop of Tylo, he became an Archbishop, and you get the life of Tylo written out, and one of the major events in the life of Tylo is a visit to his monastery by Maddox, who prays with him. The fact that they actually mention that Maddox is there means Maddox is a biggie, he's a big man. And you also get the charters of Land of Cathedral being signed by King Myrig, and alongside him, signing next, is Maddox. So Maddox is, again, a very important person. And every indication, and again, you don't get mentioned in the Welsh triads unless you're a leading prince or a king, and Maddox is splattered all over the triads. So he's a very important person indeed. He's no, he's no small fry. Okay? Absolutely. But unfortunately, that area is now underwater, or it's right up to the mounds. Uh, yeah, there were five or six mounds. We've got a description of the area. Uh, would be neat because we think there would be DNA in those mounds also. Uh, the archaeologists that dug in there didn't want the bones. They wanted the trinkets. That's what goes in the museum. They threw everything away. Thank God one of them kept the jaw. That uh, could be a problem because there were 11 people in that mound. If he caught the wrong jaw, he probably a descendant. Probably would match up, but it won't be a father-son relationship, which we're looking for. Back here. Yes, Lewid. Cluid. Cluhod. 
Well, he said to be a son of Malik. And could actually... Jim, Jim Michael has a text for the poem and a translation, so if you get in touch with him, I think he's on that one. Could actually be Morgan, because he was conceived overseas, that's what Morgan means. Yeah. So we're looking at somebody who was probably 10 years old, who was yeah. back with, uh, with him, talking to King Arthur, saying, hey man, we ought to go over to this place, this place is no good here where we are, we can't plant. So it 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 says it says colored. It doesn't say black. Yeah, negri. So it's he's a dark dark one. Yeah. So could be could be half breed. You see, and we could have half breed on the throne of. Written for He's definitely identified as knight, N A I S Papa, Nebula Papa. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, Buffalo in the Druid fight. <laughs> Well, we've had our first stone. We expect many more. <laughs> yes, go ahead. What you're talking about is 1970 and Arkansas, 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 Yes. 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 Well, short yolk, medium yolk, and long yolk. So it's the same thing. Yeah. But nobody's looking, and nobody's listening. That's all we ask. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to say that Alan Wilson has some of his re research books here, if any of you are interested in uh, purchasing tonight. In addition to that, I'm sure that both gentlemen would be happy to talk with you down front. Uh, we thank you very much for coming this evening. Jim Michael with the Ancient Kentucky Historical Association and <clears throat> we're affiliated with the with the uh, Confederate the Kentucky Confederation of Historical Associations today I'm recording a program for you that was presented in January of 1993 at Elizabethtown Kentucky and uh, it's how the alphabet was lost. The alphabet that we're talking about is the Colburn alphabet, and it was found on a tablet at Grave Creek, which is Moundville, West Virginia, about 10 miles south of Wheeling, West Virginia, in 1838 by a fellow named uh, Tomlinson. Now the tablet is only an inch and a half to two inches in diameter and about three quarters of an inch thick, sandstone, and yet it held 22 alphabetic letters. In 1843, Henry Schoolcraft came to West Virginia to look at the tablet. It had received worldwide publicity. Uh, after it had been uh, announced by Tomlinson uh, about two years after he found it. This was about ten years after Joseph Smith had found the golden tablets and consequently Tomlinson said that uh, he didn't want to pick up the stigma of all the controversy that had been involved with, with uh, Joseph Smith's tablets. 
So for a couple years, he kind of didn't tell anybody about it. Then later, uh, he announced it and it received worldwide attention, and that's when Henry Schoolcraft came to, to Moundville. Now, Henry Schoolcraft was the uh, co-director of the Bureau of Ethnology, later the Smithsonian Institute. And after he delivered his paper in the British Isles, he set out immediately to figure out what this tablet was. He recognized 22 alphabetic letters, said that, and one hieroglyph. Now, let's take a look at Henry Schoolcraft. Uh, if you read the Mound Builders, you'll find out his background. He was commissioned by President uh, Madison to take over a Indian outpost as the Indian agent uh, on the frontier. He married a one-half Ojibwe Native American woman, and in the 1800s, he had to have known of the Legends of Maddox. It was certainly published by John Filson in 1784, and in 1808 it was in the newspapers, certainly in Kentucky, and I'm sure West Virginia, two different places here in Kentucky. So the question is, if he knew about the Welsh-speaking Indians and he knew about the uh, Prince Maddox legends that were floating around on uh, practically every watering hole in Kentucky at that time period, why didn't he think that this was the alphabet of the Welsh-speaking Indians, which it was? Unfortunately, he wrote to Copenhagen in Denmark, and then he wrote to Paris. Now these people told him he's absolutely right, it was an alphabet, and that 16 of the letters were in fact uh, Celt-Iberian, which, which they are. This alphabet was left on the Iberian Peninsula, the Celt portion of it may be a misnomer. But then 14 of the letters were definitely Old British. Well, he had all this information. The question again is, why didn't he write to the British Isles someplace? He didn't. Uh, they'd also mentioned that maybe one or two of the letters might be Phoenician, so he wrote to, to, to Tunisia to see if some of these letters were Phoenician, and then he wrote to Greece and Italy through the Mediterranean, and he got confused. Then the <coughs> his predecessors, people who followed him, Cyrus Thomas, John Wesley Powell got caught up as the uh, great debate is uh, described in the Mound Builders book by Silverberg. And uh, they got, the, the, everybody had a view on who built the mounds. Uh, Thomas Jefferson certainly did. Ben Franklin did. And of course, the conclusion was nobody was here before. Uh, Columbus, therefore, it had to be the Native Americans, the American Indians that built them, and that's the way it went down. So, we'd like now to take you up the river uh, to West Virginia. Uh, we have a record of General George Rogers Clark uh, having gone up there in 1775 to look at this mound. The mound was the largest conical earthen grave mound in the world and uh, was certainly known by Jefferson at that time, 1875, and by General George Rogers Clark who went up to look at it. You'd find it by simply going up the Ohio River. I'm sure that's how he traveled at that time. Today we would go to Cincinnati on Interstate 71, pick up Interstate 70, and go across through Ohio and when we end at the end of Ohio, we cross the bridge right into Wheeling. We turn right and follow the river down uh, 17 miles, or 10 miles uh, south till we get to Moundville. And there we'll see the historical mo markers of Moundville and of the uh, Grave Creek Mound. We're going to look at a million dollar museum there. We're going to have a chance to talk to the curator, the lady who calls herself the superintendent. Uh, works for the park department and uh, and you'll hear some of the strange translations that we find that were on the uh, the, the small Grave Creek tablet.
West Virginia, and it's named for the Grave Creek Mound. Okay, the mound was 900 feet around, 700 feet uh, high, and its largest conical mound in America. The inscribed stone found in it has never been deciphered until now. Uh, and near the near was an Indian fort built by Joseph Tomlinson. Tomlinson is the one that dug in this mound and found the tablet in 1828. So here we stand in Moundville, the city of Moundville, at Grave Creek. Grave Creek Mound, it says this world famous mound was built by the Adena people. Isn't that interesting? Sometime before the Christian era, doesn't they don't know it was built by Christians. The mound was originally 69 feet high, 295 feet in diameter, and was encircled by a moat. Isn't that interesting? There were many mounds in the area, hence the city's name, Moundville. In 1838, the Grave Creek Mound was tunneled into by and two log tombs with several burials in the grave uh, offering were found. And now we're going to scan right over here to the mound. And you can see the mound from the back side. We'll try to get a little bit better view of it from the other side. There's actually a walkway up and around it where people can climb. And it says that it was 69 feet tall. Other recordings reported it being 100 foot tall. The 1838 investigation. And then later you see the, the second uh, shaft being uh, dug in at the bottom. But the contents of the upper uh, chamber indicated that there was one skeleton 1,700 disc shell beads, that there were 500 shell beads, uh, a bar gorget, expanded bar gorget, diamond-shaped gorget, five copper bracelets, 240 fragments of mica, and an engraved stone tablet, as you see here. And in addition to that, there were uh, it, below, there were two skeletons, uh, expanded center bar gorget, and five, uh, 650 disc shell beads. I have not been able to see those here, but here is a close-up of the tablet. Again, a <clears throat> close-up just as, as we, we have it. <clears throat> So we'll have a chance to look at that again. Uh, there appears to have been a ring around it, and the date again, they say here, was 1838. Differs a little bit from what we've uh, read before. The letters beginning from left to right. Here's uh, various attempts to translate the Great Creek Tablet, and it says that uh, that uh, Henry School Craft, it's Craft, not Croft, uh, simply tried to identify it. He, or he didn't really try to translate it. He simply reported. Uh, he. said that there were there were ancient alphabets such as runic phoenician ancient greek etruscan old british uh, ancient gaelic 
Celtic, Libyan, and Numidian. Between 1857 and 1875, three Frenchmen offered different translations. The chief of immigration who reached these places, or this island, has fixed these statues forever. Another one that was more suave, another one by Levi Bing. Thy orders are law, thou shinest in the uh, impetus elan and rapid as the chamois. Now uh, here's some more, and this is, uh, this time Jules Opert, the grave of one who was assassinated here. May God revenge him and strike his murder, cutting off the hand of his existence. Next one by Buckingham Smith, and this one appears to be, uh, uh, I pray to Christ, his most holy mother, son, holy ghost, Jesus Christ, God. Buckingham Smith. And uh, then in 1907, a Moundville resident provided this version. United States of Egypt built by states of Western Union. Pretty wild. Then we have a couple more. Here is uh, Delph Nora, who has been planning to publish a very complete article about Grave Creek Tablet before his death. Claimed the most puzzling translation was was made in 1928 by a man named Andy Price uh, in a booklet that was admitted a fiction fictional treatment Price said the characters were original English letters somewhat distorted and read Bill Stumps Stone October 14th 1838 <laughs> okay uh, what made this unusual Beside the fact that the stone was discovered four months before that date, uh, was the authorities of the National Museum in Washington took Price seriously and accepted this as the correct interpretation for many years. Then over here we have another one, and this is a 1953, and in an article published in the Pittsburgh Press, Joseph C. Ayub, or Ayub, uh, believed the inscription to be Phoenician and read, you hope to be uh, imbued with measures of purity, manners, industry, misery, folly, and strength. Okay, Olaf Strandwold, in his book Norse Inscriptions on, on American Stones in 1948, offered this interpretation. It says, I knelt on the island on the Yule site on metal land, now the island is a hod, H-O-D-D. -D. Uh, on this man's name and hod, a sanctuary for holy things. Meadow Island uh, meant the mound was surrounded by grass before trees had grown there. Isn't that interesting? The, uh, <clears throat> another explanation of the findings and it says on June 16th, during the removal of artifacts from the upper burial mound, uh, Abelard Tomlinson, along with several others, including Dr. James Clements, reported the discovery of a small gray sandstone tablet. It measured uh, two inches by one and a half and was about three-eighths inch thick. Uh, it was inscribed with curious unrecognizable characters and symbols. These symbols were arranged in three parallel lines of apparently 22 distinct characters plus a ideogram or a hieroglyphic symbol. Okay? Here is a replica of what they found and it does appear that uh, the cross does have something around it that uh, looks almost like the head of a bird. Uh, interesting. Now in addition to that, of course, there was a stone found at Braxton. Shepherd's tablet was found in 1832. It uh, simply has circles. And 
and uh, then the Cincinnati tablet, and it was found in 1841. This is an interesting uh, reproduction of it. And then the circular inscribed stone here, 1843. Then we come to what they call the Wilson Braxton tablet. And again, this is a, uh, you can see the big cross, the letters on it. Then we've looked at this one before, the Lakin tablet. Okay. And then they also have put on Lakin B tablet. Wilson Braxton tablet, you'll notice, uh, has the script as you see here. And again, what they've tried to do here, the inscription that they give us is the Teth Honored Tumulus. We really like that one. And as you see from the one above it, which is also what we've read before in caused to be queen and great, the tough tablet and so forth. Unfortunately, neither one of those are correct. Here's the new evidence. <clears throat> and uh, this, of course, uh, gives credit in 1975 to Barry Fell from Harvard for the inscription. And uh, <clears throat> he does say it's Iberian script, but unfortunately he doesn't know about Colburn and the bridge. And of course he's reading it from right to left which is absolutely wrong and uh, he says that it was uh, influenced by Carthage and uh, therefore a little difference. The only problem is he has the same letters meaning different things in different places. But interesting uh, that uh, his work would be here uh, on this particular site. The view <clears throat> looking out of the window here at the museum of the mound. You can see the path as it goes up. We'll get another shot of it outside. A map uh, <clears throat> uh, showing the earthwork attributed to the prehistoric people You'll notice that the town is in the center in red. We've got the uh, circular earthworks here. If we scan up a little bit here, you'll see that there's a rock tower. And as you notice on the uh, terrain, another tower, uh, hilltop fortifications just about in all directions. So we'll scan down here, and again, you've got the village, then you've got uh, a uh, another mound coming across we've got a rock mound and it says rock tower and then up here is another mound now you'll notice that the Ohio River comes right down right down through this area and uh, certainly uh, uh, speaks well for the for this particular site, being on the Ohio River. Okay. As we scan down now to the bottom, you'll see another high point, uh, very likely hilltop fortification. Okay. Little Grave Creek, and as we come down the creek, it's where we see the circular mound. That's where it gets the name, the Grave Creek mount now and uh, I'm giving a little shot here of the mound I'll hit the backlight and uh, again this time you can see the you can see now the uh, path that's been used to go up the mound to the top when I first came here there were children playing up on top of this, this mound. Brings in the foliage a little better for you. A table model that was designed for display in the museum to give you an idea of what the mound looked like. Has the moat that goes all the way around it, a, a little bit of a hill there, kind of a 
maybe a uh, five foot uh, uh, earthen uh, old wall, he might say. And then it has a ring platform on the top. At least that's the way they've displayed it. Ah, great Creek Mass Take. Oh, thank you, Susan. And uh, tell us about the uh, where the tablet is. Well, the tablet. The very, tablet. Yeah. Are you talking about the Braxton tablet? No, here? no. I'm talking about the Grave Creek tablet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Grave Creek tablet actually is in the collection of a family who live in Richmond, Virginia. I see. Um, in a 1952 Ohio archaeologist. Yes. I read an article about a man who was at an auction. Oh yeah. And for two dollars, he bought this stone. The Grave Creek tablet. The Grave Creek tablet. Oh my God! Was it the original? Yes, he said it was the original. Now, of course, you know, Grave Creek tablet is a is a hundred and fifty year controversy to Grave Creek Mail. Yes, I understand. Those people thinking that that is a legitimate thing. Absolutely. Those of us believing that. It is a wonderful historical document to the mound. Yes. But certainly it is not a prehistoric. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I don't think you'd find any professional mm -hmm. who believes that the Great Creek Tablet is legitimately something. I see. Why is that? Because no matter how many people who have claimed to, to, to determine the yeah. translation, mm -hmm. if you talk to the world leading, world's leading epigraphists who actually can go back to Gaelic and Ogham and all of those things which tell you that... It's none of those, is it? it? It's absolutely not. That's right. And um, I just don't honestly think that it's legitimate uh -huh. prehistoric piece. I see. Well, what about the five bracelets have those been analyzed we're talking about the bracelets that were found on the yeah. arms of individuals yeah you know some of them are, uh, three of them i know are shell bracelets two of them were made of copper now those are the bracelets that only you two were i see yeah it said five on your display but that's probably wrong right your display is wrong it said five copper bracelets five on display five copper bracelets oh, well they've got a picture up there of my film but yeah okay those are the, the, they're not all five certainly are not on display and i don't know how many are on display the remainder of them certainly are we do have a, a um, facility was built in the era that our um, museum is uh, chronic control i see so when this display when everything was brought over from the old museum in 1978 when it closed and this facility opened to the public right we uh State of West Virginia contracted a, a, a gentleman, Beverly Mosley and Associates, who are museum yes. designers. Yes, are. we know them. Mm -hmm. We know them. Well, you know, the, the, the process, the, the thought process then was, unlike the Little Museum, which everything that they ever found, they hid hanging. Yes. The process here was, don't duplicate a lot of things. Yes. Tell a story. I see. So that anyone coming through this display, yes. if they take the time to read, it is a self-read tour. I have been looking. Okay. Uh, so... The, the, the copper we know is from South, uh, Southern Great Lakes Superior. I see. Tower Island, where, mm -hmm. where the, uh, mm -hmm. where the uh, Indians did most of it. But has it been analyzed to see if it has been smelted? Because we have found some on the continent that it has been smelted that, uh, that's great antiquity. Uh, not to my knowledge. It needs to be. Where are the copper? Where are the copper bracelets? They're, if, they're, uh, if they're not on display, then they're, they're no, in they're my archives. They're in your See, There is one on display. Oh, a copper one? Yeah. It, Excellent. And if you look in the timeline. Okay. Now, your job here is your curator. Uh -huh. uh, do you work for the park department? Uh -huh. or, uh -huh. West Virginia. West Virginia. Uh -huh. uh, State Park. You're a historian or you're an archaeologist uh -huh. or a historian? Actually, my degree is in accounting and they hired oh. me with State Park. I also function as the State Park Superintendent. I see. And I've been here since 1981. Okay. And the, the, the idea in those, most State Park Superintendents prior to me yes. were coming out of biology I see. and history. Okay. Then as State Parks became a, a large revenue for the state of West Virginia, they decided maybe they needed business people. Oh. Well, so good. what they've done with us is, and now the new superintendent's coming on our Parks and Rec. 
you know, what happens, um, every state park is different. West yeah. Virginia's magnificent state park system. So what happens is, over the last 10 years, I probably have read everything, going to as many classes well, as you do once you become engrossed in your job. Yeah. So this turkey, does now you can see, after listening to Susan, why I stopped the camera at that point and went out to the car and got the alphabet, showed it to her. But you can see why she's so confused and so is everyone else after seeing the multitude of, of uh, crazy translations that uh, these people have hung on the, on the uh, Grave Creek tablets. So at this point, I'd like to uh, stop and uh, give a little bit more background on the mound. Now you heard that they thought it wasn't Christian, and the reason for that was it was before the Christian era, they said. The reason for that is, was the carbon dating that they did. They took core samples by running the drill bits down through the periphery of the mound. Uh, they did not take from the log tombs samples for carbon dating. There may not be material there, I don't know. But they got it from the fill material and it went back 2,150 years, plus or minus 225. Put it back to uh, 175 B.C. to about 53 B.C. So unfortunately, the, and then they say that's perfectly all right, it, it uh, fits with the Adena uh, model that they have, but they really don't have the, the uh, Adena people pegged down if they're calling this Adena because they didn't get here, we think, until the 6th century, and they certainly were Christians. The Christian cross at Braxton, the Christian cross at the bottom of this certainly indicates that. Now, the alphabet could have gotten here before that, However, the Christian cross certainly puts it into the Christian era. And uh, I'm sure that it got here much after 55 B.C. So we have a problem with the carbon dating, and the problem basically is that. Now, the thing that you may have picked up was that there was a moat all the way around this, <coughs> this great mound. Well, there was another moat in, in Ashland around that big mound. There have been circles around and a moats around many of the other fortifications that we've found. I don't know if they're fortifications, but certainly mounds. The one at uh, we've, we've all looked at at Mount Oreb, for example, certainly has a moat and a, a ring around it. Now, the literature indicates that the moat was filled in in the early 1800s. It wasn't there when when it was surveyed, uh, and that, of course, would be at the time that Henry Schoolcraft came to to look it over and work with it. So uh, now we'll go to a few of the uh, charts that I'd like to show you. Hey. Susan was a little confused on the translations with all those translations and such weird ones too. Well, let's take a, another look at the mound itself. This is of course the famous Squires and Davis etching that was done in 1848. This about five years after a uh, schoolcraft had visited the mound. 75 feet tall, has a little superstructure at the very top, kind of a, like a little amphitheater, and uh, right here. Okay, and this is from Barry Fell's book. It does show the two different uh, uh, chambers, burial chambers, you'll notice that the uh, there's about 38 feet difference between them and it's important to understand that this is where they found the the actual uh, small tablet with the writing in it. Now this is an important document because this is just West Virginia now but it does show you uh, all of the mounds in West Virginia and if you look where it says map location, that right here, it shows you the distance from Pittsburgh 
all the way down. Many, many mountain, uh, many uh, mounds that were all identified as being Adena, whatever that means to them. But uh, we think their dating is wrong. But it does list the references. And if anybody wants to do some research in this area, wonderful. We've certainly now got some uh, things that we can look for. So here is coming down the river from Pittsburgh uh, down to Grave Creek, which is 101, 102 miles down right here at Moundville Bottom. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's another glance at the at the actual stages. They call them stage one and stage two because they think this is the way the two tombs were developed at two different time periods. Uh, I don't think so. I'm not sure. They may have been. Uh, the, the writing, however, was in the top one, and it's certainly the top one uh, is the writing that would come out at our, at our uh, time period with our alphabet and certainly with the Christian crosses. Now, the problem with the dating, you heard him talk about uh, before Christ, pre-Christian. The problem with the carbon dating is that the carbon dating, as you see, was taken at the Bohr sites. I can't get this light on, but anyway, you can see where it says C14. That's where the carbon dating was taken, out in the fill portion of the mounds. These were bore drill holes that went down. Had they taken it from the wood that was in the tomb, we would have a much more accurate time. However, the time period that comes up on the carbon dating from these borehole sites, this is looking down from the top, you can see how conical, cylindrical it is. And incidentally, you notice that running out from it, you have trenches that go out through the actual moat. But all that was modern fill in there because it appears that the moat was filled in around the 1800 time frame. Okay, now with the radiocarbon dating, it says 2150 plus or minus uh, 225. Now that really takes us from about uh, 175 B.C., not 200, uh, up to about 75, 73 B.C. So there's your time frame based on the radiocarbon, little pieces of charcoal that they found out in the fill portions of the mound and uh, certainly not uh, a good, good enough for the uh, type of work that we need to date this. It really needs... And then they... They even add insult to it. They say the, the 200 B.C. date seems entirely satisfactory for the late Adena activity at Grave Creek Mound. Well, we know it's not because of the, the Christian cross and so on. Okay, this, <clears throat> you notice the black portion at the top of the map where it says map area. That portion up on top there is uh, the actual part that we're looking at. Tiny panhandle of uh, West Virginia, the very tip needle, a rabbit ear if you would. But anyway, as you come down that stretch, that's where we find the map. And that's, uh, you see where Wheeling Bottom is? That's about where the, where the bridge comes across, I-70 today, and then about 10 miles down to Moundville is what you have. Now at Moundville, you notice that sharp hair, hairpin turn there. That is the part we're going to be looking at a little closer. Now this is the map that Schoolcraft, or Schoolcraft uh, sketched out in 1843. Now the important thing here is that his north is going sideways. So again this hairpin turn would really look like this if we put it on the map correctly. I'd like to come back because all of his lettering goes the other way. And you'll see that we have uh, ancient earthworks in several different places and you'll notice that hilltop it says lookout but those hilltop fortifications are lookouts all right because they control the river and you can see both sides of it from those lookout points just like our hilltop fortifications that we have up and down now where it does say large mound in red that's where the the, the actual uh, uh, grave creek uh, mound is located Okay, over to the right now is the, is the mound in red down by the city. Okay, 
Here is the tablet, and of course that brings us to the question is, what is the hieroglyphic at the bottom uh, symbol? Is it a Christian cross, or does it have, in fact, an animal head on it? Well, if the cross had extended out as it did in Braxton, which is very definitely a British Christian cross, it would have gone farther than that little uh, animal, and therefore the animal is not a chip. I think it's, it's purposeful. I believe that is an eye on it, and I believe that it's either a bird or a horse's head, but it's an that it is part of the Christian uh, trilogy. Now, if you look at the letters, take, for example, the first one there on the Grave Creek Stone right here. You'll find it up by going through the list here. And uh, it's an RH. And now I can't find it. But uh, where is it? The important thing is that you don't find that kind of a letter. There it is, right here. You don't find it any place else. This is simple. This is a T. No problem with the A. That's uh, simply without the crossbar. The A here is duplicated. It does have a bar. This is a combination letter with an A and the NM type of box, like this. Okay. This is a combination of both of these. So you see, we've got a combination letter here, a combination letter here. This letter is a D. We don't understand what the crossbar is. We've translated it without that. But there is your Grave Creek stone compared with the Braxton stone. It appears that the Braxton stone was a little bit larger, but there's no question about the alphabet being the same on both of them. This is the alphabet as appeared on a school wall in Wales in the 1840 time frame, the same time that Schoolcraft was writing around the world. And if you notice at the very top of it, I've highlighted it here, very top, there is your Awin sign, the Trinity sign, the basis for this alphabet. And there are the letters all sketched out at that time. And here is the stone that Susan talked about. And you, you recall she said it's in the the home of some private people that bought it for a couple dollars in the 50s and <clears throat> it will be donated back to the museum uh, upon death and uh, they did say that there is one letter that's wrong that's missing and you'll notice right in the center of it it appears to be blocked out I can't get my light on so I'm going to come up here and point to it but it's this portion right here that appears to be missing. If you put a stroke in here, that does become a P. And it does then become meaningful. So there you have the, the alphabet, and, uh, and now you know how it uh, became lost to Americans. Uh, the people who followed up the predecessors to, to uh, Schoolcraft, Cyrus Gordon, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Cyrus Thomas and uh, John Wesley Powell simply got tied up as the as the uh, mound builders book says in who built the mounds and by the time the argument which was never really settled but got debated with Benjamin Franklin's theories and everybody else's theories uh, they simply lost track of the fact that this alphabet was out there, it is there. It showed up other places and each time it's put under because nobody could adequately translate it. So there we have how the alphabet was lost and uh, we thank you very much for this, uh, the time that it's taken to watch this particular film. In respect to uh, Schoolcraft, Schoolcraft knew it was an alphabet. And when he wrote to uh, Copenhagen and Paris and Berlin and Rome and uh, all around Europe trying to find information on alphabet, uh, yes, it's incredible that he did not go to Wales. It, it beggars the imagination. But nonetheless, everybody he wrote to recognized it as an alphabet. And the modern stamp that it's uh, petroglyphs 
kinds of uh, non-alphabetic non origin is simply untenable. And I think the stance has been adopted because people simply couldn't read it, couldn't identify it, couldn't know what to do with it, and wouldn't admit that they didn't know. So they then made it out to be in the Indian Petrol. Well, Alan, if they, <coughs> in, in 1840, if Coolcroft had written to Wales, would anybody there have recognized it? I'd say, uh, in every circumstance, uh, in any crowd of three, two people would have told him. Right off. And would have translated it. Yeah, could have translated yeah. You'll find the alphabet is sold in Wales at uh, conventions or meetings and, and nationalized centers and localized centers. No, today. And people set up stalls and they have illustrated little cards, I suppose, with the alphabet on and all sorts of decoration on it. And they sell thousands and thousands every year. And most homes have probably got one hanging in the wall. Somewhere. In fact, I think uh, one of the teachers had one uh, uh, in one of the schools. Yeah, you know? yeah well, it was, um, it was what they did. They drew up. Um, a chart of the modern alphabet, yeah. A, B, C, D, E, and then they put at the bottom the uh, organ musical system, right? and then they put the Colburn alphabet in detail with what is A, what is B, C, and they were using this in schools, teaching the children. So every school child in Wales, if he'd approached a ten-year-old child in the street, would have said to him, oh yes, uh, that's what we have in our school, and would have known the alphabet. That the school craft chose to work everywhere in Europe, except when? Amazing. Yeah. Astonishing. 